Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Now you know that we've already built this home and you've already seen the thumbnail as well, so today we are talking about landscaping basics. When I put out this poll, you guys ended up being pretty split between the forest style landscaping and the cottage style landscaping, so I figured let's break it down and do everything. So today we're covering the absolute basics, how to start placing plants and scales, ratios, colors, all those things. And I think that that will give us a really good foundation to just immediately jump off of when we jump into the forest style and cottage style landscaping. So first I'm going to break it down into the terms that I use. I don't know if these are very common terms, but also I haven't found anybody else making videos quite like how I make them. So if you have corrections, suggestions, etc., as always, leave them in the comments down below. So of course, the top of the plant menu are trees. We aren't going to talk about trees until the end though, um, for the main reason that they are big and they get in the way of the rest of the landscaping. So we'll, we'll talk about trees toward the end. The first thing we actually want to worry about are the bushes or shrubs. This is, by my classification, anything large and just green. No flowers and like off the ground significantly. So while that would include pretty obvious selections, like these guys here and this boxy one, uh, that would also include objects like this low-laying palm, palm plant, the wild grass, the hosta plant from Cats and Dogs, and I guess if you wanted to, the pea bushes, although I don't know if you'd want these as like a core part of your landscaping or not. I guess it depends on how many wild parties you're throwing. There are also the rows of hedges, which I won't be addressing as much uh, in this video, although you're of course more than welcome to use them in place of some of the other hedges, depending on the style you're going for. Uh, I'm just going to be focusing on using the more individual pieces today. Same kind of goes for these uh, sculpted topiaries. This isn't exactly something that you'd use like as a shrub, even though it is large and green. Uh, this is definitely more of a sculpture element that you would add toward the end of your landscaping, um, or at the very beginning if you wanted like a sculpture garden to build around that. We'll cover both of those, but they're not shrubs today. So basically, any of these plants would fall into that shrub or bush category. The next category of plants that you're going to look at to build your little painter's palette for your uh, landscape would be flowers, which is, get this, anything with flowers on it. Big, small, growing out, but it has to have some sort of base structure. Uh, so this is coming out of a bush. This one, like it, it has that sort of structure around it as opposed to say the wildflowers which are simply just coming straight up out of the ground. So that's what I mean by having a structure at the base. The wildflowers would not be in this category um, but pretty much anything else. I'm not going to pull them all out because I think I think you guys get it. Anything that has a base structure and has flowers on it, these are these are all flowers. So that would be your next category. We also have rocks and the thing that you want to do with rocks is make sure that they're the right color for your world. The easiest way to do this is to see if there are other rocks in the world around you. Uh, we have some back here, so if I move my rock over there, scale it up so you can see it, that's that's pretty close to the right color, right? We'd probably want to use one of these first two swatches. This one is a little bit on the warm side. This one's definitely not the right color for the world, and black, uh, I would not use that in general for this world either. So that's what you have to worry about with the rocks, is making sure they're the right color, pretty much um, for texture and a little bit of extra structure, basically something for your plants to like hold on to. Anyway, so that's rocks. And the final category, aside from standalone objects like trees and sculptures, would be filler. So that would be these plants that are growing straight out of the ground, these little flowers, or other low-lying objects like the low-lying pale yellow flowers, right? They are very, very short, so that's what you're looking for there. I would also put this plant from Island Living into that category. It's a little bit tall, but if you, oops, that was the wrong direction. Uh, if you scale it down once with the bracket keys, it makes some really great filler, especially for the more cottage and tropical style landscapes. So yeah, we're going to build our palette out of these objects. Now creating an actual palette is of course not recommended um, or needed in any way, shape, or form. I just thought it'd be fun for the video. So let's actually pick what plants we're going to use for this build. It can be really helpful to look at the world around you for some inspiration to get the general idea of trees and rock tones and greens that you're going to be using, um, as well as to see if there are any sort of native plants that you want to bring into your landscape. I'm not seeing too much here that I want to work with, which is great. We can start from scratch. So we're going to be talking about what each of these plants sort of brings to the build, which is a little bit more in depth than I usually go. For example, if you want your build to feel much more manicured and grand, you want to go with something very structured and clean. So you'd pick this for more of an estate, um, and this for more of a backwoods cabin, and then this little round guy for something in between, which is kind of what we have here. This decorative grass makes an excellent addition to any sort of suburban landscape just because so many people have it. It's all up and down my street, like it's just, it's everywhere. So this is a really good secondary option. Not only does it provide some different colors and height and texture, it's just really common 
in the general area uh, that you'd see a house of this style. Something taller like this would often be used to frame an entryway or something like that, although it can definitely be used as a core part of your landscaping as well. If you live in a more humid area, you're probably going to see a lot of ferns around, so this would be another one leaning more on the rustic side. The agave plant is pretty much going to be in either very contemporary landscapes, again this is specifically talking about The Sims 4 as well, um, so we're drawing from the real world, but like of all the plants, this is the most modern looking plant, so it's probably what you'd use there or in the deserts. Uh, this plant would not work with this build because it doesn't really complement the shape, the style, or the climate. The hosta plant would also be a great sort of accessory shrub just because it's a really common plant in a lot of areas and it comes in so many fantastic swatches. This is a plant that I would encourage you to use multiple swatches of in the same landscape. As opposed to the other plants, which we'll talk about in a second, where you're going to pretty much pick a swatch and then run with it. But the hosta, not so much. That one you can really mix up. Oh, and then we've also got the wild grass, again, more rustic, less manicured. And the low-lying palm plant would be in warmer climates. Uh, typically, you see more broadleaf plants in warmer climates. Um, so that's where that would be. Again, much like the agave plant here, not really applicable to this particular style, but it could work for yours. So time for me to pick my plants. I really like the hosta, so I'm going to keep those, and I'm going to use this as my sort of main shrub. Next up, we need to pick some flowers. If you have a really strong color palette going on with your build, picking flowers that are going to complement that would be fantastic. Um, like if you had yellow shutters, you'd probably want to bring in some yellow flowers to really bring all of that yellow together in your landscape. I don't. I have a lot of brown and very pale neutral colors here, so I could go with pretty much um, whatever I wanted in the flower department. However, I do want to make sure that my colors all work pretty decently together. For example, I might not want to go with a full primary color palette here. I will be picking three flower plants but perhaps I want them to work together a little bit better. Looking at color wheels and color palettes just like you do for interiors can also be really handy for exteriors. Something like this would be much more homogenous, and if you really did want a couple of one color and then something to like really pop as more of a statement plant, you'd probably want to pick something with significantly different shape as well. For example, some combination like this. Now this is definitely a tropical plant and wouldn't look super fantastic with this build, but it's different um, in the leaf shape, in the overall shape, in the height a little bit, um, but mainly in the color and how the color is presented as one giant pink flower. I think I'm going to go for some blues and yellows, so I'm going to use this red flowers in the blue swatch, the sunrose bush in the yellow swatch, and the dull daisies in white. I think that that would be a good combination for mine. I like having a lot of variety in the height of my plants, so that's why I'm running with those. And I've already pre-picked my swatches to make sure that they're going to run decently well together. Uh, the yellow will bring some warmth warmth and brightness, and the blue and the white will blend in a little bit more with the build while still being quite different to the shrubs. So we're really building out our palette here. Next up, let's talk about rocks. Now I would recommend using all of the different rocks. Uh, just I'm, I'm a huge advocate of putting rocks in your landscaping. I was afraid of them for a while. I don't know why I'm not anymore. Uh, so you can pull all of those out and what you're going to do here is make sure that they're the color that you want or even a mix of colors, right? So like I said, the first two swatches are pretty much what we're going to want to use. Personally, I think the first swatch goes better with my foundation, so I'm probably going to stick with that. But say you were in um, the desert and you wanted some desert tone rocks, you may choose to keep some in that sort of second swatch, but have a couple of red rocks in there as well, uh, just to bring a little bit more variety to that landscape. And finally, to fill in the middle, let's talk about our filler plants. So this is anything super low to the ground that is just going to cover any gaps in the dirt we may have. How much of the dirt you want to cover depends a lot on your personal style. Pretty much one of these plants, some of the low-lying squares like this, if you really want to cover that dirt, would be pretty helpful. Sometimes I even use the Molten Volcano Flowers, scale down one as my filler plant. So if I were to pick the low-lying pale yellow flowers, these do only come in the one color, uh, but it does go pretty well with the fact that I have the white and the yellow flowers, it matches the shape and size, and it's a different green which means it's going to stick out a little bit which is nice we like that contrast the grasses i would typically use this for a more rustic area we wanted it to feel a little bit more overgrown and weeded i don't care so much i would like my weeds to be gone the dull daisies this can be a really great place to bring in that little bit of extra color as well especially some of these dual tone swatches these are just they're really cute so maybe i'd want to bring in a little bit of pink which can go really nicely with the yellow or just grab some more yellow to spread that out a little bit more stick with blue or white for these to just keep it more of a neutral calm palette without quite so much energy which is kind of what i'm going for here we'll bring the energy with the later styles same goes for the wildflowers here where you'd want to pick a swatch that has colors that are going to complement what you already have or be quite different this is 
again, energy situation. So this would be high energy, well, mid energy here, because it's got some blue in it. This one would definitely bring the energy back down with all those cool blues like we already have. And then the pink would bring in a huge contrast and really bring a lot more energy and vibrance to the build. I'm going to use the low-lying pale yellow flowers and I'm only picking one. So I think those are all of the plants that we need to get started. Now when it comes to actually placing the plants around your build, you kind of have two options. You can either do the terrain paint first or the plants first. If you prefer to keep your landscaping much more condensed, I would actually do the plants first. So we can do that over on this side. And if you prefer having a better idea of where you're going to end up before you get started, go with the terrain paint first. And also before we move on further, I am going to turn on move objects. Landscaping is a great place to do it because it's not going to interfere with your sim's life. It's just to make things pretty. So for PC, control shift C. For console, that's, there we go. For console, it'll be all four trigger buttons and then BB dot move objects. When you hit enter, you should get that confirmation move objects cheat is on. If you don't, try BB dot move objects on and you should get that. Starting with our little bit of landscaping over here, I am going to grab my bulbous bush. And overall, in any area that you're sort of going to see at the same time, you want about an odd number um, or an odd number of groupings. Uh, for example, I could just put one there. That's an odd number. That would be a very small area. Or I could have two, which is an even number, but it's still an odd number of groupings, right? This is an odd number, even though it's an even number of groupings. But then if I do this, but all of a sudden it's just it's a little bit too repeaty uh, so if you wanted to keep both of those you'd want to add a third grouping right a fifth plant um, over to the side somewhere or shrink it down and tuck it inside so that's that's my method for that i feel like it doesn't make a lot of sense but it's what i use so if you like my landscaping uh, that's kind of what it is a total of an odd number of plants or an odd number of groupings ideally both but you know you do what you can with what you have. So that would be how I would start laying out this landscaping. Uh, resizing on PC is with the bracket keys console. I will put your controls up here because I cannot remember them off the top of my head. I'm going to go in with my second round of bushes, which is my hosta plant. Now, if I'm going to keep this pretty small, I'm probably going to leave this at just the one. However, I can recolor this to be whatever is going to make the most sense for right over here. I actually like this swatch. That's quite bright. Uh, so I'm going to use this one. And again, if I wanted to add a little bit more, I would shrink it down one. So that's still just the one grouping, uh, which is an odd number, but an even number of plants and so on. I'm just going to do the one though for now. Once you have these set up as sort of your core, um, like where all the other plants are going to be anchored to, I like to add rocks at this point. I don't have as much of a method for rocks because it just generally depends on how much you like rocks. I like them quite a bit, uh, so I definitely like to have at least one or two per sort of bed area in my garden, if not several more if it's quite large. So here I'm going to have at least one rock in the back here to sort of fill in the area next to the home, and I'm going to add some smaller rocks off to the side here. This is going to provide a difference in texture, a difference in color, a little bit of an understood border. If you really want to go crazy and just like place a whole bunch of them all in a row to make a little border for your garden, you're more than welcome to do that. Hold shift and alt at the same time uh, to get those in there. And that's, that's how that works. After you have your rocks sorted out, then you'll go back in and grab your flowers. Uh, now for such a small area as this, I would just probably pick one or two of your overall flower palette that you're going to be using. Uh, like I'm going to grab one of my red flowers, which are blue. So just don't let that confuse you too much. Rearrange this a little bit. And I might grab a couple of these small dull daisies, right? I'm going to put one here. I'm going to scale one down to place here and place a final one back here. So that's just a very small area to be landscaped. This is pretty dense as well. I prefer my landscaping to be more dense. If you prefer your landscaping to be more spread out, you'll just do the same thing. Just make sure that you can see between all of your plants a little bit. So I'll just spread mine out a bit like so. I might add an additional uh, flower plant or an additional rock or something over here. Uh, but that would be a much more spread out sort of landscaping setting. And then once you have your plants pretty much how you like them, uh, you can go through and resize things if you feel like they need to be resized. Turn things around, adjust it once it's good to go. Grab your terrain tools, go to the paint tool, grab your brush tool, and then pick a dirt that is appropriate to the world. Um, now this world is pretty sandy, so we could go for something kind of like sand. However, under plants on grass, I prefer to use a dirt color. Just because plants, you know, their matter breaks down, it becomes dirt. That's kind of how that goes. Uh, we do also have this pine duff, which almost looks like uh, mulch, if that's something you're interested in. I often use the Smarter Starter Soil, and you're gonna bring your softness up about halfway between the middle and the end. Bring your brush up to a reasonable size, 
then just start painting under your plants. You want the dirt to spill out a little bit from under your plants so that you can see it. Um, it really helps separate all the green of the plants from the green of the ground. And there's your little flower bed. Now at this point is when you would grab your filler plants. So I'm gonna grab my low-lying pale yellow flat plant. <laughs> so I'm grabbing my low-lying pale yellow flowers and I'm gonna look and see if there's anywhere where I feel like there's too much dirt or if any of my plants need to be adjusted. For example, I'm not really a fan of this one being here. I'm, I just don't like how it looks. So I'm gonna scooch this back and actually place some of my filler plants in here instead. I may also feel like I want it to wrap around the build a little bit better, but I don't really want another bush. So instead I'm going to grab that filler plant and then just paint under it again a little bit more with some dirt. So that's how I would landscape a small area using plants first. Uh, but let's talk about a larger area, especially if you have some sort of goal in mind. If you want uh, a chess table, sculptures, something like that. I would recommend starting, even if you know you want sculptures, still start with the terrain paint um, because otherwise you might put your sculptures too far away or too close to your build and this can just help you see things a little bit better. So I'm going to start mine coming out from the side here and loop it around like so. And let's say I want some sort of garden decoration here. Uh, if you have Get Together, that has some, let's get to work, Get Together, that really has some fantastic uh, landscaping elements, which I am a pretty big fan of. You know, like maybe you want a wishing well. That's actually a good idea. Let's start with a wishing well. We can have a well and we can have something a little bit smaller, uh, perhaps a bird bath. We'll put a bird bath up here. Right, so you know that you want a couple of specific elements in your landscaping. You can add these after the fact too, like maybe we're looking at this and we're just like, hmm, you know what this needs? Some metal. Let's add uh, the sundial, like so. We're going to add them first in this case. So now what you're going to do is pretty much the same method as we just used. We're going to start with our shrubs and then move on. Oh, also if you wanted a tree, they do kind of get in the way, uh, but you could pick which tree you wanted. Rather that was something large and colorful, flowering, a bonus item you got from a pack, I think this was cottage living, or even just like a normal looking tree. It'll get in the way while you landscape, but you could place it and then use a plant that you're very clearly obviously not using, like some cactus, cacti, <laughs> to mark its place and then landscape sort of around that, or you could just wing it at the end. Anyway, on with our shrubs. So once again, I'm going to start with the bulbous bush because it is basically the most plain sort of shrub that I have. And I'm going to use the same method where I want to have overall an odd number of groupings and or an odd number of plants. So I'm gonna start back there and say, I don't really wanna add one right here, right? Cause it'll cover up the bird path, but I can add one to the side and then another one over on this side and that'll sort of frame that out pretty nicely. So what this is doing is providing some sort of very, very basic grounding in the landscaping for these more decorative elements. And it's providing some height toward the middle of this very large bed, otherwise it will look quite flat. And then from here, I'll go into the next round, which would be the hosta plant and start placing those. Same general method where I'm going to place a couple toward the back as well as toward the front for some continued variety in height and shape. I also like the hostas because you can scale them down quite a bit and they still look pretty decent. That's how I will lay those out. And now rocks. Rocks are super helpful in large beds like this, again, for just the height and variance and whatever. Um, and you can make them into fountains as well, which I am not going to cover in this video. We could talk about adding water features to a landscape at a different time. I think that'd be better as a standalone video. Uh, but you know, it's just like, it's some height, it's some texture, it's some interest. We can also add these as lower objects to fill in the ground in front of something that we really want to see, like this wishing well, uh, without covering it up with too many plants. And again, just have them act as sort of a border. Next, to go in with the flowers, I'm going to start with three of each. So I'm going to start by putting in three of my red flower, which is blue. And again, I am holding shift and alt simultaneously to be able to get these to place and resizing with those bracket keys. Uh, and then I'll go in with three of my sun rose bush. And why am I doing three? So that I can build them up on each other and it'll look organic. And then three of this, as opposed to just placing down straight lines of everything. So as you can tell, I'm going to have to have a lot more than just three of each plant, but if I rotate which one I'm putting in, it'll just keep everything from looking too clumpy. So I'm gonna go in with the red flowers. Now this one is pretty big, so for my second round, I think I'm just going to add two. And then go back in with three more of the sun rose bush. Oh, also if you have rocks and you feel like you want even more dimension, uh, you can raise your plants up and sort of set them on top of the rocks. That could be cute. 
and then a few more of the dull daisies. And again, this is pretty dense. However, what is keeping this from being a cottage garden, which is also known for being quite dense, is it doesn't have nearly the variety of swatches and colors. And again, how close you place your plants to one another is totally up to you. I really like having them much more dense in the middle and then a little bit more spread out along the edge. Finally, I'll go in with my filler plants and just sort of see if there's any areas that I want to cover up a little bit more. And then do one last look and see if I need to re-swatch anything. Like I might add a little bit more color variety with these hostas, especially the ones that are right next to each other. And if you look at it and you just absolutely hate it, you can always just go through and recolor some things. Uh, like maybe I decide I really don't like the blue and I really like the yellow. I can go through and change all of these to yellow. I don't really have to change any, um, like I don't have to go through and swap out any plants. You can just re-swatch stuff. But I do recommend re-swatching everything uh, for the more suburban style landscaping. Everything tends, there tend to be a lot more limited selection of plants. I think that was the sentence. Once you're pretty satisfied with your landscaping, you can go in and add a, like a footpath, which would be first laying down some dirt, especially if it's going to be running alongside your landscaping, and then going in with some gravel, putting your brush more toward the middle of the softness area, and then running that through. I also just realized that this is the wrong color because those flowers are red, and we don't have any red flowers, so that would have been something to consider, but I did not. Oops. If you want a pond, grab your lower terrain tool and just lower a little bit of an area. And then once you decide about how deep you want your pond to be, grab the flatten terrain tool, uh, set it to be pretty soft and fairly slow, especially if you're newer at this, and then pick where on this wall you want your pond height to be. It could be quite shallow, or you could do it a little bit deeper, um, but you're going to use this flatten terrain tool to sort of push the pond into the shape that you want. Personally, I find this is a little bit easier to do if I actually fill my pond as I work. It's just easier for me to shape, see the shape that I'm working with that way. Once you're relatively happy with the shape of your pond, of course, you can always push in from the outside to make it a little bit smaller, fix the shape. Uh, you can grab the smooth terrain tool, then just sort of run it along the outside of your pond, which will help smooth some of those edges. I do like to paint the bottom of your pond a pretty dark color, like this muddy mud, but then the edges should be whatever dirt that you are using for the rest of your landscaping. You want it to spill over a little bit, just like with your plants. Uh, you can also change out the watercolor by clicking the outdoor water decor, and the first option is the water styles. Uh, so base game, you have the ordinary water like this, of course. We also have the purple water, uh, the pond scum, which has sticks and stuff in it, the mossy water, which looks like it has some algae growing on it, leafy water, which is, you guessed it, leaves, pond water, which is kind of green, uh, which you'd think, like, ah, gross, why would I want green water? But then you look at it and you realize, oh wow, like, the blue water actually kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, this Swimming in Sparkles water from Get Together is quite clear. I also really like their flowery one, especially if you have flowering plants. Um, this would work best if you had pink plants on your lot, which we don't. Um, there's also the murky, murky, murky brown um, and the freshest of green water. But now let's talk about landscaping around ponds specifically because it's a pretty similar process. Uh, you just have to pay a little bit more attention to how you're placing your things. And I actually recommend starting with rocks on this one. You still want your rocks to match your world color, but if you scale them up and place them carefully toward the edge of your pond, you can actually get them to sort of be sunk in the water a little bit, which can help give the edge of your pond a more natural looking shape as opposed to quite artificially round. From there you can start grabbing your plants. Now you could use the same plants that are already in your landscaping if you want this pond to have been put in by whoever uh, lives there or if they take per particularly good care of their pond, but if you want it to look a little bit more wild you could grab some of the wilder looking plants regardless of what other plants you have sort of on your property. So we could carry this landscaping down a bit, right? We could grab our bulbous bush and place a couple of more creeping toward the pond. Uh, the flowers could come down and start to overlap. Maybe pick out a couple more hostas. Now, I am not a plant expert. I go with what looks decent in the game. I'm not super familiar with the regions and how these plants grow. So if I'm putting like a desert plant in the water, feel free to just not do that. Um, I do like adding some flowers along the edge of the pond though. It can, again, sort of help hide the edge there, which you may or may not want, um, especially like not around the whole pond but just a little bit of the plant spilling over can really look nice. Or we can go for a little bit more of that rugged look uh, where you'd want to grab something more like the wild grass to start having that grow up around your rocks, you know, where it's harder to get the lawnmower. The knotgrass grass actually has some companion swatches now or companion objects, the leaning knotgrass grass and the knotgrass grass sands and fluorescence or without flowers, basically. Uh, these plants came to the menu when the pond tool was introduced with the cottage living update. Um, I have been a huge, pan huge fan of the pond tool ever since. 
So that's just, you know, some really fluffy looking plants. Uh, you can grab some of the unkempt shrubberies, especially if you scale them down a little bit, and then again, move them more toward the edge of your pond to have them sort of growing out over the water. Ferns often live close to the water. There are even some species that grow literally in the water. However, they don't really look like this. So how much you want to play with that uh, is totally up to you. I like using this plant because it looks like some of the plants we have in our area that grow out over the water. Um, however, obviously this this actual plant doesn't belong in the climate. So again, it's that balance of like what looks good in the game versus what is realistic and what matters to you. So there's a much more wild looking uh, selection of plants and then the much more tame manicured section. This would also be a great place to add, you guessed it, wildflowers, which can be fun to actually stick inside other plants as well. And then once you're fairly satisfied with the plant layout around your pond, uh, that would be a great time to start introducing trees. So now we can talk about trees. Uh, trees, 10 out of 10, should reflect the world or be very obviously decorative. And what I mean by very obviously decorative is like uh, this plant, right, the tea tree, clearly this does not belong to the world. However, if you put it in a planter or if it was sort of a statement piece in your garden, right, like if we had this instead of the bird feeder over here, like obviously that was placed there on purpose. This plant probably has some special fertilizers, like that plant is, is there on purpose, but we would not want to use this um, around the lot as if it was just growing there wildly because that is very, very clearly does not belong to this world. So for a more natural looking tree, this is the Cats and Dogs World, and it does actually have trees that it comes with. Uh, you can also get trees for the world out of the debug menu, which I'll cover more toward the end of this video. Like I said, this is a much more in-depth landscaping video than I've done for a while. Um, so we have, of course, the maple tree, and these do come in a lot of different swatches. If you have a number pad on your keyboard, by the way, you can use the plus and minus keys to go through the swatches. Uh, so this one obviously works with the world as well as the white birch tree and the dogwood tree, which again has a few different swatches. We've got full bloom, partial bloom, and no bloom. On top of that though, we have a number of other deciduous trees that would work, like the oak tree, which is quite similar to whatever tree this is. We could also place a weeping willow tree, especially next to the pond. The willow is sort of a plant that requires a lot of water, so it would make a lot of sense for it to be in a pond area. The base game also has this quaking aspen tree, uh, which is another white barked tree. You can tell that there, oops, you can tell that there are some differences even in the game between these two trees, let alone in real life. But for the sake of the game and having some variety, using both of these trees together will give a really nice sort of birch forest look, which is super cool. Of course, we don't want these trees all conglomerated together, uh, so let's talk about actually placing these trees strategically on our lot. One big thing to pay attention to when you're placing your trees just structurally is making sure they're not actually clipping into your house. And when you go to check the lot um, to upload it, you wanna make sure that those trees are not blocking any of the rooms sort of in the house, right? So if I go here, the tree is not actually clipping in, which is fantastic. It is blocking a bit of the view from this angle, so we'd have to decide if we wanted to keep it there or not. Um, but given that this angle is still unblocked, it's probably fine. We may also want to use trees to hide parts of the build we're not a huge fan of, or areas of the build that are really lacking in windows. So I might grab this white birch tree and place it up close to the house here, again making sure it's not clipping in, and of course checking before I upload it to the gallery to make sure it's not blocking any rooms. Now just the one tree there is a little bit bland, so if you want to add more than one tree, don't just copy paste the exact same thing. Try sizing some of them up or down. This tree is a great candidate for sizing down, like so, although it can also look good sized up. Um, it's just going to be quite large, probably a little bit too large for this particular build. It's only two stories. And again, we also have the quaking aspen tree, which is another white barked tree. Uh, so it'll just provide a little bit more, a little bit more volume to your little stand, stand of trees there. You generally don't want your trees to be more than, um, let's see if I can find a good tree to show this. Okay, so Quaking Aspen Tree, as it stands, is about the same height as the house. Now you could go with it being a little bit larger, however, if it's too much larger, your house is going to look quite small on the lot. Uh, that would be good if you wanted it to look like a small rustic cabin. Not so great if the house is supposed to be larger and more grand, so we wouldn't want to use a tree taller than the house if we're going for like a mansion or something. However, if all of your trees are at like a one level height, uh, then your build is just going to look enormous. So in general, you want your trees to hit somewhere um, above one third of the build height, but below 
more than that and more than an additional third on top so basically if i'm looking at the build head on right we've got about one two three thirds to the build and then an additional ghost third up here you want your trees to fall within these top three thirds and i know i split it into fourth but since it's based on the third of the build that's how math works i don't understand anyway <laughs> uh but you wouldn't want anything other than a decorative tree to be in only that first third of the height of the build you want your trees to fall generally within these two uh possibly a little bit taller again if you're going for more of a rustic cabin but we're not here start within that general rule of size and then branch out if you feel like your build needs it i trust you so now that we have our trees covering general areas that we don't really want to see, providing a little bit of framing, right? We've got almost like a green semicircle around the build now between the tree and then the plants and then the trees. Um, so framing is a great point of using trees. Uh, and then just decoration, shading. Once you have all that figured out, you're going to go in with your terrain paint again. You could also do this all at the end, uh, but that's not how this video is working. And you want to paint a little bit around the base of your tree. It'll help them feel more grounded and established. You could also provide a similar sensation by actually grabbing um, some low-lying plants, some wildflowers, or that wild grass and having it grow up around the base of the trees as well. This landscaping is looking more and more peculiar as we go along because I'm just throwing everything in there, but hopefully I can get it shaped up enough that you'll click on the thumbnail. Well, it worked for you. And hey, since it did work for you, why don't you like this video? It really helps the channel out a lot and it helps me know that I should like, hey, make more landscaping videos maybe. So thank you. Let's see, what is next? I think we still have to talk about terrain elevation and how to landscape on a hill and valley, right? That kind of goes one in the same, two sides of the same coin as it were. Uh, and then we'll talk about debug as well. So where would be a good place to put a little hill? Maybe here, maybe we'll go over a hill to the house. So grab your terrain tools. We're going to use the raised terrain tool. Now I like to just sort of go organically like this. However, if you know generally how tall you want your hill to be, you can raise this with whatever settings are there on the screen. I pointed them with my finger, which doesn't help you, uh, but my settings say control in the bracket keys so I can raise these. And every raise with this is the same as one step leading up to a building. It's one platform level, it's one level of a foundation, it's all the same unit, so you can use that. Or if you're just trying to eyeball it like I tend to do, you can click the raised terrain tool, use a soft brush, go pretty slow, and I want this to be about half the size I want my hill to end up being. I'm just going to do a little hill here, right? So something like this. Now, if you want a cliff, that's totally cool. Grab your flattened terrain, flatten terrain tool and just flatten from the top you're going to see that dirt show up on the edge. Now here's an important thing you need to know about the dirt on the edge of your terrain, is it depends on the world. It is only dependent on the world and you cannot paint over it. So if you want it to be something else, you're going to want to grab that smooth terrain tool and smooth it out. And then from there, add whatever other paints you want. Now, by default, you might notice that you have a really, really bright green overlay on uh, your terrain. This can be really helpful for elevation mapping, or it can really hurt your eyes. It hurts my eyes. To turn that on and off, just like the grid in the rest of the menu, uh, just hit the G key. Then I like to go down at my terrain from an angle like this so that I can really see how smooth it's getting. I might need to slow things down a little bit, right? I'm just going to do a nice, just a nice little hill. It can also be helpful to paint your path over your hill, especially if you're going to have a path over your hill, um, almost exclusively if you're going to have a path over your hill, uh, because that can help you just see a little bit better if there are any extra lumps and bumps in the terrain that you need to worry about. Looks like I have one here, for example. So I'll go back and grab my little smooth terrain tool again, shrink it down, and just fix that little bump. But here's the issue with landscaping on hills, right, is the plants start to float off. So how can we avoid that? The answer is time and stress. Also, for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to turn one side of this into more of a cliff. I'll give it a nice hard edge and just bring this out. So how can we deal with our plants floating up the sides of our cliffs and hills? I'm going to start with the bushes once again, and these are really helpful for just sort of hiding some of the more awkward parts, uh, like this piece here, which is sort of coming down at an angle. I could just put a bush on top of that and it's gone. Fantastic. And now if I use Alt to sort of start scooting it up the hill, you can see that there's a bit of a gap there. Uh, using some flat rocks at the bottom can be really helpful with this. Just carefully using the Alt key to slowly move them in, and once you see them start to go up, you want to bring them back down to the ground and place them. Large flat plants like the low-lying yellow, pale yellow flowers uh, can be really nice on a hill, but you sort of have to place a bunch of them close together. Because uh, if I place one at the bottom, one in the middle, and one at the top, obviously they're kind of floating, they're sticking out, it's a little bit weird. So at that point I'd want to rotate it a bit and then place an additional set of plants sort of between them so that it looks like it's all flowing up the hill. 
Now these are still sort of sticking out kind of funny, so I'm going to have to scooch it around, finagle it a little bit, and make sure everything's actually lining up where I want it. Um, but in the end, you're probably going to end up using quite a lot of plants if you really want to hide that edge, or you're going to use plants that are quite small, because while they will still float, it won't be quite as noticeable uh, just by the nature of them being smaller. You can also shrink them down and just uh, almost make them appear larger uh, by making a ring of the smaller plants on the bottom of it. See, so now this doesn't look quite as much like it's floating uh, when compared to these. It also matters whether or not you want to landscape at the top of your hill or your cliff. Um, if you do, you can have those plants sort of overhanging at the top a wee bit, which will help hide some of the floating. Um, and if you don't, you may want some sort of very clear border, either with a path, uh, rocks, something like that. If I'm going to have my landscaping overflowing to the top of the hill, I'm filling in a lot of the space with those pale yellow flowers. And then beyond that, I'm going to be using my same sort of method of place three to five of each plant type and just keep moving on to help it look organic and not too structured, but also pay attention down below to see what's floating. These are floating. That's no good. So I'm going to go in with a rock. Um, you're going to be moving your camera around a lot for move for planting um, up and down hills, that is for sure. If you haven't already, I do recommend switching to The Sims 3 camera. It's what most creators use. It's I think it's pretty easy. Uh, so you can do that by going up to this setting here, camera controls, Sims 3 camera. This is also how I'm able to use the alt key. I think with a Sims 4 camera setting, you're not able to do that. Uh, so if you've been following along and also struggling to follow along, I might have, uh, might have should have mentioned that a little bit earlier. So I do apologize. All right, so I've been paying attention to where I'm placing my plants to try and keep them from floating. And if they are floating, I am doing my best to cover that up with other plants or rocks. So this is what the bottom of my cliff area is looking like right now. It's definitely spilling over quite a bit, um, but that's sort of necessary at the same time. We obviously have some elevation change here, which is pretty fun. If you just can't be bothered with all of that, <laughs> no worries. Uh, another fun thing to do on a hill would be to actually just create like a little border of plants. Let's see if I can get this. And I'm using the alt key to place it uh, strategically along the edge of my path, as well as the bracket key to resize as I'm going, uh, using the shift key to keep placing multiple plants. And this may not be great for every single style, but you can see that little row of hedges sort of really accentuates the curve of the hill. And depending on your landscaping choices, that could look quite cute. And then for valleys, it's just going to be more of the same, just kind of in the opposite direction. Another thing that you may want to place that I just remembered because I never placed them um, are garden lights. There are a lot of options uh, just in the base game itself. There are some that go on the side of your house, but there are also these little lights that you can just place in, in your garden. Uh, there are some fun ones from other packs as well, though. For example, Get Together. You guys know I love this pack. Uh, has some really cute ones. Seasons has this lamp post, which is a little bit big for what I'm going for here. Uh, but at the same time, I could like raise it and put it on these rocks. Like that'd be pretty cool. That'd give almost like a lighthouse vibe. Some of them are a little bit larger and quite obviously meant to be more of a decoration or a statement piece like this one from Snowy Escape. Or we have these fairy lights from the, which pack is this? The Little Campers Kit, which also has these little lights, which go between them can be fun for a little bit of a border. Now if you're placing these on the diagonal, uh, you're pretty much going to want to start with one lamp and then one string of lights. And you're going to add one lamp and one string of lights and so on uh, just to get the spacing and everything correct. But if you're just playing along a grid, it'll look fine. There are also these hanging lights, which we have some from Seasons and Snowy Escape as well. So we've got Seasons, Snowy Escape, and then these three from City Living. And if you do like these, you can use them. Uh, it's just that the other end of it, the other post, is going to be in decorations under the sculptures portion. I recommend sorting by pack. It's going to be a lot easier to find. And there it is. And you just place that it's at the other end. And there's a little arch of lights. This is probably more of a backyard thing, but it's still fun. I do wish they would have left the other half of the light in with the rest of the lights though, like that other post, like they do here, but not with the city living one, unless it's here and I'm just super duper blind, but I don't think so. Anyway, um, these can be helpful to add along walking paths, so we can add these every few tiles up a path. They can also be helpful to frame entrances, such as the entry point to your lot here. And if I turn on the night, you can see how much light those produce. So, you know, it's just, it's a little something, but it adds quite a bit. You can also put them into your actual landscaping if you want something to be lit up. And if you actually go into the fountain decorations in the little outdoor water decor area, 
there are floating lights that you can place on your pond as well, specifically these uh, from City Living. This really doesn't work for this particular style, uh, but it is there. Uh, you can make your own floating lights by grabbing something like, say, this, Wicker Whim's Candle Bowl, and you can just raise it using nine until it is sort of resting on the top of your water. And now you have floating candles. How cool is that? I think we're good to move on to debug. So let's talk about using debug in your landscaping. Also, if you feel like any of this should be a separate video, it probably is over on TikTok. So if you haven't followed me there yet, you should do that. All right, let's talk debug. So open up your little cheat bar thingy again. Uh, no cheats are actually necessary here. I mean, like you don't have to put any testing cheats on. You're not going to ruin uh, your awards or anything like that. So we're going to type in bb.show hidden objects and bb.show live edit objects. This will unlock both sets of the debug menu. So now if we go into something like say wall decorations, we should see unlocked a whole lot of extra wall decorations, right? We've got the participation ribbons you can win at the festival. We've got crafted items from Eco Lifestyle. Like you're about to unlock a whole lot of stuff just in your normal catalog. But what I'm after is the debug menu, which you can find by typing in debug, hit enter, wait for a second, and there we are. So debug is where you can find just so many objects. This is not really sorted very well and most of the objects in here you can't search for because they're just called debug. But basically what debug is, is it's the world building objects that you see around you. Uh, this can be why it's super helpful to sort by world. For example, we are in the cats and dogs world uh, because now I'm actually going to be able to find the plants and objects from the world around me, like cattails, which can be fantastic for a pond. The Cats and Dogs World version of the low-lying pale yellow flowers. We have some of these plants, which are over here in these planter boxes. Uh, these bushes, which you can see over here. So it's basically the world building items just in this menu. Now it is important to note that with some things like these debug fences, some of them your sims can walk through, some of them they can't. So you do need to be aware of that if you're using any of the debug items. So that's how you access and start finding stuff in the debug menu. I definitely recommend, especially if you're new to debug, sorting by the world that you're building from. Um, also, if you wanted like just random empty houses, this is how you get those as well. That is for another video though. So let's build up a little bit of a landscape just using some of the debug objects from Cats and Dogs. I'm going to use this edge of the pond for my little debug area, uh, but let's start with some of these rocks. Now the rocks do generally cost money, which I think is interesting, and they are quite large already. So if you're going to be sizing up rocks from the main menu, you're probably going to be sizing down rocks from the debug menu. But even if they are still for simoleons, that's a lot cheaper uh, than your standard 30 to 70 simoleon rocks. Whoops, see this one's quite large your many, many simoleon rocks uh, that you'd find in the normal menu. So we can start our landscaping by adding some rocks. We've got our cool piece of driftwood here that I really, really like. I can grab these debug cattails. And here's another thing you need to know about debug is unlike most of the build items, uh, you can't hold shift and alt at the same time to place a whole bunch of them. Uh, shift and the eyedropper tools do not work on the debug objects. Now, before you start commenting, yes, I do know that there is a mod for this. However, I know that a lot of people who watch my videos don't use mods, um, either because they're new to the game, you're on laptops, you're on consoles, stuff like that. So that's why I prefer to not use mods in my video. However, if you would like to see an overview of mods at any particular point or see some custom content or something like that highlighted, I would love to do that. I'm also going to scale some down just for a little bit of that size variety. My voice is leaving, which is fantastic. And there are some little cattails, which I really wish we just had in the normal menu, but we don't. So we do have to add them like this, but that's, you know, that's like, that's wildlife pond. Like it's so fun to add. Man, I haven't been in debug in so long. Let's see, we can add some of our world bushes. Now I'm going to scale this one down a little bit just because it's, uh, it's a little bit obnoxious otherwise. But again, that just sort of ties into the rest of the world. We've also got some statues and things from the world that we could use. Maybe not that one in particular, but this one's really cute, right? This could be something that we could add to our landscaping. You may also find different arrangements of some of the plants. Like this looks like the wildflowers and this looks like the wildflowers, but it's not actually our wildflowers. If I just grab this real quick, um, you can see that it's quite a bit larger and it's not actual, like it's kind of the same swatch, but it's not really. Uh, so yeah, that's just, it, there's just so much extra stuff in the debug menu. You guys, you need to check it out. You need to explore this, you know, start going through it yourself. Uh, some of my other items that I really enjoy from debug now that we're back in the main menu include these alien mushrooms, which do glow. 
Um, not recommended for traditional suburban landscaping. High key recommended for magical fairylands, okay? Let me know down below in, this, in the comments of this video if you'd like me to dive into like a magical fairy type of forest landscaping in the forest landscaping video as well. I'll give you a couple of extra days so that I can make sure I see comments before I start recording, but like if you're actually interested in how to use glowing mushrooms in a way that makes sense, I would love to show you, but also it's not like everybody's cup of tea. Also, I have these floating glowing flowers, which are just so fun to just throw into your landscape. Like, it's fantastic. Uh, what else do we like from the debug menu for landscaping? Uh, you can also access some extra ca extra cactus plants from the debug menu, specifically from Strangerville, which is fantastic. Uh, if you missed the last video, we actually built a folk Victorian in Strangerville, and using these debug uh, cactus cacti in our landscaping would have been fantastic. I just didn't want to go into debug in a beginner level video uh, specifically about building a house. So you can find you can get extra cactus plants that way. There are also some extra Strangerville rocks in the rocks menu. Um, so you can go back and forth between finding some of the extra debug things in the normal build menu as well as in the general debug menu. And if you choose to use mods, I do recommend checking out Twisted Maxi's Better Build by. I haven't used it personally, um, but I've heard fantastic things about it. Okay, I think that's everything. I think that covers landscaping pretty generally, <laughs> but let's go back to the basics real quick, just as our last little overview here. So. When you're planning your landscape, for most lot sizes, you want to pick one or two sort of green shrub-like items, two to three flowers, at least three different swatches, um, and then two to three different types of flowers for a total of three. Rocks, you can use as many or as few as you want, but you want to make sure that they match the world color. That is going to be extremely important to your landscaping. It will, it will genuinely just look off otherwise. And if you prefer to not have too much dirt showing, grab a filler plant as well. You might grab two on a larger lot. If you're going on anything larger than a 30 by 40, you're going to add one or two plants to each one of these categories. An additional shrub, an additional filler, an additional flower or two. But remember, the rocks have to be the right color for the world. When you start building up your landscaping, you can place the terrain paint first first or not, uh, but you want to make sure that you're placing your large green objects in a total of an odd number and or an odd number of groups, preferably both, and then start layering in your other plants a few at a time to keep it looking organic, which is generally traditional for more like suburban uh, flower bed sort of style, which is what we went through here. If you have any questions or if I didn't answer something quite thoroughly enough, please let me know in the comments down below. I would love to take care of that in a future video. Thank you so much for landscaping with me today, and I look forward to landscaping with you again very, very soon. Bye!